Looking for a new playmat or some custom sleeves? You can support Magic Untapped in the process by clicking on the affiliate link for Inked Gaming in the description. The 45th expansion in Magic the Gathering history, the 301 card Shadowmoor set came out on May 2nd, 2008. The set takes the light and bright atmosphere of the game's previous two sets, Lauren and Morningtide, and turns them dark and twisted as the second half of the Lorwyn Shadowmoor Mega Block takes things over. The story of Shadowmoor can, conveniently enough, be read in the Shadowmoor book, edited by Philip Athens and Susan J. Morris. And unlike most Magic the Gathering books, this one is not a novel. Rather, it's an anthology that includes a novella that tells a set story, as well as a series of short stories based around the world of Shadowmoor. And now for something completely different. Roisin Meander, a seer giant, has lost her goat. She wanders around Shadowmoor in search of it, oblivious to the destruction her meandering is causing to everyone and everything else. Mist Meadow, a rather large Kithkin village, finds itself in the path of the unknowingly rampaging giant. Marlin offers the village protection from Roisin's meanderings, but is turned away from the town Sen, Donal Alloway, who accused the elf of lying about her true intentions. Alloway then tasks the Kithkin scout by the name of Jack Cheerdag to steal an item of Roisin's as to steer her away from Mist Meadow. Along the way, Jack faces many of Shadowmoor's dangers, including sinister scarecrows, aggressive cinders, formerly Lorowin's flamekin, and a Morrow gang led by the pirate Captain Sig and his strange non Shadowmoorish first mate, Bridget. After a fierce battle between the scout and the band of pirates, Bridget breaks rank and offers assistance to Jack by way of her magical bow, which bestows the power of flight, allowing him to escape the fray without further harm as he resumes his pursuit of Roisin Meanderer. Bridget, meanwhile, departs from Sig's band of pirates to return to Kithkin life, but crosses paths with Marlin along the way. The two converse, remembering one another from the old world, and the Kithkin promises to assist the elf by doing all she can to help Jack become hero of Mist Meadow. Marlin then tasks her two Vendelian fairies, Visa and Iliona, with finding and assisting Jack with his mission. The fairies succeed in rendezvousing with Jack just as he is about to approach the unsuspecting Roisin. With the fairies' help, the Kithkin manages to locate and steal a scroll, which the prophetic giant uses as a journal of sorts to record her visions. Unfortunately, fairies sent by Una, Queen of the Fae, were also seeking Roisin's scroll. The two parties met, and with assistance from Visa and Iliona, Jack was able to overcome the opposition, but not without being lightly poisoned, just enough to knock the Kithkin temporarily unconscious. When Jack awoke, he found himself near Mist Meadow, but without Roisin's scroll. Alloway's plan, however, worked as the pilfered scroll successfully rerouted Roisin Meander away from the village. The Kithkin returned to town and was warmly greeted as he was named Hero of Mist Meadow. Five Kithkin brothers, Wander, Might, Kind, Clever, and Hero, each decide to depart from the safety of their Kithkin village and to see the world around them. The first brother, Wander meets a fairy who convinces him that it would be a good idea to explore a nearby swamp. While there, the Kithkin gets hungry. He spies a tasty looking mushroom. Unfortunately, the mushroom winds up being poisonous and Wander perishes. The second brother, Might, runs into a Bogart raid leader. Thinking himself the stronger, he challenges the Bogart but fails to notice another group ambushing him. He, too, perishes. The healer, kind, 
finds a marrow on Death's door, he saves the merfolk's life by performing surgery. Unfortunately, upon recovery, the marrow slits the healer's throat. The fourth brother, Clever, meets a tree folk at a high crossing, only to find that he could only cross the bridge if he could solve the tree folk's riddle. Clever succeeds and is granted passage only to fall to his death, the bridge being nothing more than an illusion. The fifth and final brother, Hero, departs from his home to seek revenge for the demise of his kin. He manages to punish the very ones who led his brothers to their deaths, only to be fatally crushed by a wandering giant who simply never saw the much, much smaller creature. Shortly thereafter, and with the brothers' village without its five mightiest defenders, a group of cinders invaded and burnt the town to the ground. The moral? Never leave home. Among Shadowmoor's Cinder Society is the Cinder Sootstoke, who are the spiritual leaders of the Cinder. Some of the Sootstoke carry the belief that the flame they lost when Lorwyn changed to Shadowmoor, and subsequently, the flamekin devolved into Cinder, can be rekindled. One such Sootstoke, known as Ascaeus, learned of a tale about a river burning stone. Determined to find this wonder, he sets off in search of it, despite his fellow cinders thinking the journey absurd. After a harrowing and dangerous journey, Ascaeus finally found what he was looking for, deep underground. As he gazed at the molten river, Ascaeus bellowed a joyous laugh. So loud was his laughter, though that the cave in which he was standing collapsed, cutting off his way back to the surface. An optimist, the Sootstoke embraced the river of fire rather than finding despair in being trapped underground with it, assuming that eventually he will find his way back to the surface so that he may pass the flame to others. In an elvish stronghold, Tekla Ironleaf, one of its five leaders, delivers a child. But this child, a boy named Joram, is not like the rest as he is born with no horns and the mark of the raven on his cheek. The mark of the raven, it is said, marks one who is to bring salvation to the elves. To be without horns, however, is grounds for expulsion. Due to the child's conflicting afflictions, the Safehold's elders agree to allow him to stay until his fourteenth birthday, in the event that his horns eventually grow in. By the time he turns fourteen, however, Joram's horns have still not appeared, and the teenager offers to leave the Safehold voluntarily. He departs just in time to be saved from a tree folk attack on the structure. While out in the wild, Joram meets a Yew Witch, who offers him a spherical artifact, telling him it would make his dreams come true. As the exiled elf tries to compensate the witch for the item, he is told that he has nothing yet to offer in exchange. Using the enchanted copper sphere, Joram grows proper elven horns and returns to the nearly destroyed stronghold. Upon arrival, he then wishes the structure repaired, and through the artifact's magic, everything returns to how it was before the attack. That's when one of the Safehold's druids questioned Joram about the curious curio that had come into his possession. As the elders examined it, black tendrils sprout out from the sphere, slaying all five of the Safehold's leaders, Joram's mother included. That's when the Yew Witch once again appears, joined by a contingent of tree folk warriors. The Safehold's elders gone, the remaining elves stood no chance. All are slain, save for Joram. The witch then finds the elven teenager and informs him that this was only half of his payment for the dream-fulfilling sphere. The other half is to keep it, forever burdened by the guilt of what he has done, for the sphere could never leave him, and he could never leave the sphere. Meme is strange. Even by Boggart standards, she's considered by most to be about three degrees off of normal. Well, normal for a Boggart. Slender and smooth-faced, she was always the subject to the other Boggart's pranks. She remembers how her mother was slain while fighting a gang brute. And she's had to run from the lackeys of Geg, a Boggart soul-eating shaman who saw her as prey. 
One day, she decides to leave her Boggart home in search of some dreadful creatures known as elves. Along the journey, she faces many of Shadowmoor's perils. But soon enough, the truth becomes apparent. Meme was no Boggart at all. She was, in fact, an orphaned elf girl whom a Boggart mother had taken in and raised. Geg's sons eventually catch up to Meme, but are soon met and struck down by elves. Afterward, Meme and her elven saviors look at one another. Then the girl turns around and disappears. Meme had decided that, though she isn't a Boggart after all, she is not yet ready to become part of elven society. A Bogart named Yasko is on a raid along with two others of his kind. While out, he hears a terrifying shriek and soon after finds two mates dead, presumably killed by a banshee. Very soon thereafter, he meets an elvish warrior. She introduces herself as Vela, and she tells him that she is out to avenge her parents' death. Meanwhile, in the background, two fairies, one a druid and the other a scion, are conversing. The druid explains to the scion about the nature of Shadowmoor and the creatures who reside there, and how he is trying to use his magic to lessen the darkness in the world. The druid conjures up a spell that sends black magic geysering up so it can be sent elsewhere, only for it all to come tumbling back down instead, slaying some nearby bogarts and attracting a banshee in the process. Meanwhile, Yasko and Vela go in search of the banshee who had slain their friends and family, respectively. As they hunt together, Yasko finds himself confused as to why he's helping this elf rather than trying to eat it as he should be doing. Ultimately, though, they find their target. Before they can strike it down, however, the banshee wails at Vela. The elf's life flashes before her eyes, and then she falls to the ground, unconscious. The banshee turns to Yasko. Instead of wailing, however, it speaks. Yasko learns that he is not a Bogart as he believes himself to be. Rather, he's a Takaran, a ghost appearing as a living creature, and that he belongs to her for the purpose of luring her new victims. In the meantime, the Druid is being called to Una, Queen of the Fae, but he refuses to heed the call. He's focused on trying yet again to exhume darkness from Shadow more despite the impossibility to do so. The scion urges him to go, but, again, he refuses. Before he can finish another incantation, however, the scion slays him upon Una's order for failing to comply. Back with Yasko and the Banshee, Vela awakens, saved by the herb she wears in memory of her late parents. She plays witness to the conversation between the ghoul and the Bogart. With the banshee distracted, the elf gets up and does her in. She then says farewell to Yasko as the Bogart fades from existence, the banshee's hold on his soul no longer there. Vela then returns home, satisfied. As for the fairies, the scion reports back to Una about the goings-on with the druid and about the naming of a new one. And Una thinks to herself that this cycle will forever repeat in accordance with her own schemes. Wib and Gwib Senex, father and son, are Kithkin from the heavily fortified village of Grey Meadow, and it's almost time for Gwib to take the watch. Just before he does, the pair meet Dagup, an elderly, one-eyed Kithkin who tells them a tale about a failed expedition upriver in which a group of Kitkin had climbed a tall hill that would then come to life and slay all but himself, though not before taking one of his eyes and most of one of his ears. The hill, it turns out, was a tentacled beast known as the Isleback Spawn. During his first watch, the young Gwib spies a dark shape in the water. He thinks back to the story the one-eyed Kitkin had shared with he and his father. Unable to get the image out of his head, he begins to think heavily on the horrors of the spawn. The youth's connection to the mind weft, the mental web that connects all Kithkin, causes paranoia, 
horror and panic to spread across the village, and its soldiers soon break rank, firing their weapons into the dark mist that has settled around the village. Time passes, and the mist soon vanishes, revealing no enemy in sight. The mind whiffs, stabilizes, and calm once again settles on the village. The elders decide to build yet another wall around the town. Meanwhile, in the river, a large school of dark-scaled razorbound fish slowly swim away. Leash is a soot stoke whose fire is almost entirely extinguished. Like his fellow cinders, he craves for his fire to return. Unlike his fellows, however, Leash is not exactly sane. Virkul, another cinder, comes to him. Leash informs him that fire can be found in the wood, which makes sense because wood can burn. Virkul, however, misinterprets Leash's words as a call to combat the tree folk who reside in a nearby grove, thinking that they are keeping the fire for themselves. In the skirmish that followed, the misguided cinder sets a few of the tree folk ablaze and, for a moment, feels rekindled. In the end, though, the Treefolk contingent overwhelm him, and he is shattered by their blows. Leash then ventures to the site of the conflict and locates Virkul's ice-cold skull. The Mad Cinder then returns to his cell, muttering to himself, Almost there, not long now. He places the skull amongst his collection from other Cinders who had fallen prey to his advice. This story takes place in the safe hold of Dusklight. It used to be a place of beauty, but repeated floods have turned the area into a swampland and, ever since, the safe hold's elves have been under attack from merfolk. Under the guidance of their leader, Aero, his deputy Kavan, and a seer named Ely, the elves are in search of a mystical artifact called Cloudbreaker which is said to give the elves the ability to summon a magical being known simply as the Ally, which will restore beauty and order to the world. As such, the elves make expeditions out into Shadowmoor in search of not just the Cloudbreaker, but also other items of lost beauty that they can bring back to the safehold. One such expedition brought Aero and his forces to the Kithkin town of Ballygol, where a beautiful lyre can be found. The elves trade a bag of seeds for the lyre. Then, Aero demands that the Kithkin surrender the Cloudbreaker to them as well. Ballygull's leader laughs at the elves, stating that they possess no such item. Aero repeats his demand, but the Kithkin dismisses it. As he turns to leave, Aero shoots him in the back, then orders the village searched and raised. Upon the expedition's return, Ely, the seer, is horrified to learn of what happened, as Ely knew the Cloudbreaker wasn't in Ballygol, and what's worse, Aero knew it as well. The elven leader then presents the seer with a bag of Dawn Glove seeds, which can grow into a plant that can be used for healing potions. As Ely goes to her garden to plant the seeds, she sees Callum, a giant living next to the safe hold, is again building his stone towers and muttering to himself. The seer sits down and begins recording the mutterings. Eventually, the plants Ely planted sprout. But it's apparent they aren't Donglove. Rather, it's Cremoisi, which is quite deadly. Alu instructs Ely to refine the plant into a potent poison. The seer begs Aero to tell the rest of the elves the truth about the Cloudbreaker. But the elven leader refuses, saying the time just isn't right. Concerned, Ely approaches Kavan and shares with the deputy that the Cloudbreaker was never in Ballygol, but rather in a nearby Morrow Lake, that Aero knows that as well, and that she isn't really a seer. Rather, the giant Callum is, and she simply writes down his words. That night, during a Morrow raid on the safe hold that killed a dozen elves, Ely has a vision. She sees Aero on top of one of Callum's stone towers, but that there is no light beyond the world, no ally that can be summoned by the Cloudbreaker, but that the journey to find the artifact gives the elves hope and purpose. After the Morrow attack, Aero and Kavan set out to retrieve the Cloudbreaker from the lake. 
The elven leader pours the entirety of the extremely poisonous Cremoise extract into the lake, and soon enough, the lake is riddled with the Morrow corpses. As soon as the poison dissipates and the water is again safe, the elves swim in and retrieve a submerged chest which contained a single rag-wrapped item. Callum arrives, enraged about the now poisoned river that flows out of the lake. The elves flee, but leave the chest behind. The giant, seeing the chest empty, howls in frustration. He turns towards the elves as they make their escape, saying under his breath that dark tings of the world are coming. Back in the stronghold, Kavan confronts Aero about knowing about the Cloudbreaker the entire time. The elven leader retorts, explaining to his deputy that it was the hope of the artifact that gave his people's lives meaning, and now that he holds it, that hope is even more real. Kavan, however, tells Aero that he has gone too far this time before strangling him to death. Ely then departs from the safe hold, which shortly thereafter is attacked by more denizens of Shadowmoor. Outside of its walls, she runs into Kavan. He tells her about the Cloudbreaker, showing her the artifact. He tells her that the elves have fallen from grace, and in their quest to preserve beauty, afflicted the world with some true horrors, and that Aeroy, through his actions, made the elves just as dark as the rest of Shadowmoor. Gavon then explains that he refuses to use Cloudbreaker to bring the elves salvation, as, as he sees it, they are no longer worthy of it. The elf then confesses his love to Ely, after which the seer asks him if they should cast the artifact back into the lake and continue to lie of their late leader. As the safe hold of Dusklight burns in the distance, Gavon kisses Ely, then drives his dagger into her stomach, killing her before climbing onto his mount and riding into the darkness, alone. This ends the story, well, stories, of Shadowmoor. The main story will continue in the next chapter, Eventide, but until then, let's talk a bit about Shadowmoor as a Magic the Gathering set. Take notes, nerd! Shadowmoor takes place, technically speaking, on the same plane as Lorin. I say technically because it's a reflection of the plane of Lorin. Think of it as a sort of alternate universe sort of thing. A what? An alternate universe. And that reflection concept carried over to the cards themselves. For example, while Lorwyn has a sub-theme involving plus one plus one counters, Shadowmoor instead uses minus one minus one counters. Additionally, while Lorwyn has very few multicolored cards, Shadowmoor has many. Furthermore, while the races found in Lorwyn also appear in Shadowmoor, they've all been color shifted as to show the races change from day to night. Flamekin, Mono Red, and Lauren become known as Cinders and, instead, became Black Red. Elves went from Green Black to Green White. Giants, Red White to Red Green. Goblins went from Black Red to Red Green. Kithkin changed from White Green to White Blue. And Merfolk from white-blue to blue-black. But Shadowmoor also brought with it its own identifiers as this set it further apart from the first half of the overall Lorwyn Shadowmoor Mega Block. One such identifier was the use of hybrid mana, something the Lorwyn Mini Block did not have at all. How much hybrid could we have? That was the question. The answer was close to 50%. It's funny in retrospect, looking back, I think 50 was too high, but... <laughs> Like, I, I think we would have been happier if it had been like third, you know, 30, maybe a third, maybe a third of the set was with hybrid. Part of the way in, we realized that some of the color pairings were going to be harder to design hybrid for than others. And I think that that's where we might have started kicking ourselves for aiming for that 50% mark. The set also introduced a creature type, not just new to the Mega Block, but technically to the game of Magic overall, Scarecrows. Retroactively, the card Scarecrow from The Dark received the Scarecrow creature type as well. Additionally, Shadowmoor introduced three new mechanics. Conspire, which gives you the option of tapping two creatures you control that share a color with the spell being cast. If you do, you get to create a copy of that spell. Persist, which cares about minus one minus one counters. If a creature with Persist goes to the graveyard and it did not have a minus one minus one counter on it at the time, it returns to play with a minus one minus one counter. And 
Wither, which deals damage to creatures by way of minus one, minus one counters, rather than with traditional points of damage that go away at the end of the turn. Shadowmore also introduced something both different and new, the untap symbol. One of the things I'd said to the team was, I really like the idea of mirror imaging. Like I'd like the idea that the things you saw in the Lorwyn version had their mirror versions in the Shadowmore version. So Untap is a really good case study of something that seems very s simple on its face and ends mm -hmm. up being very complex in play. The problem we ran into, we had a couple problems with Untap. One was, if you look at the Untap symbol, it was literally the tap symbol, I think rotated 180 so degrees, 180. and then everything that was white was black, and everything that was black was white. It was a, you know, uh, negative yeah. image of it. Um, but even though it was upside down and a negative image of it, people just saw it as the tap symbol. And so people would play it wrong. And then the second problem we ran into is just the mind state of knowing that this thing that's tapped could become untapped was really hard for people to wrap their brains around. Hmm, very confusing. The set has a whopping 19 cycles. Probably most notable of them are hideaway creatures, each of which are the awakened forms of the hideaway lands from Lorwyn, such as the card Knoll Spine Dragon being the awakened version of Spine Rock Knoll. If you look closely at the Lorwyn's card art, you can almost see the slumbering dragon. Monocolored hybrid spells, which can be cost for three mana of one color, or you can substitute two generic mana for each colored mana in the casting cost, meaning they can actually fit into any colored deck. Beseech the Queen, for example, can be cost for three black, six generic, or a combination of the two. Rare persist creatures, all of which have not only the persist mechanic, but also a powerful enters the battlefield ability, such as Twilight Shepherd, letting you put back into play all your creatures that were sent to the graveyard that turn. Lieges, which, in addition to their own specific abilities, grant a plus one plus one boon to creatures with which it shares its colors. Demigods, each of which have a converted mana cost of five, consisting entirely of hybrid mana. And filter lands, each of which can be tapped for one colorless mana and have the ability of tapping for a combination of any two specific allied colors. The filter land Graven Cairns, by the way, is actually a reprint as it made its debut in the set Future Sight three sets earlier. In addition, Shadowmoor had a number of cards that were essentially darker reflections of cards found in the world of Lauren, with examples being Incremental Blight, which is a reflection of the card Incremental Growth, Hollow Sage, which is a reflection of Fallow Sage, and Rise the Redeemed, which is a reflection of Rise the Exiled. As far as notable cards, Shadowmoor definitely had its fair share, starting with Kitchen Finks, a hard to kill persist card that does a very good job at shutting down aggressive decks. Can we talk a little bit about the making of Kitchen Finks? Heather's Chipmunk? Heather's sure. Chipmunk, yes. <laughs> Why is it Heather's Chipmunk? It is Heather's Chipmunk because um, when, when we were back in New Hampshire, uh, we had a chipmunk that lived in a hole in our yard. And at one point, Heather says to me, Heather, Heather's my wife, she says, will you make a card for me if you're going to make all these cards? And I said, I, I could probably sneak one into the set. Uh, she says, I want one based on that chipmunk in the yard. And I think it went through all of design with the name Heather's Chipmunk. Um, because I remember it kept getting kind of funny side eyes when, when people that weren't familiar with the backstory would see this card called Heather's Chipmunk. Who is this Heather and why does she have a chipmunk? Fairy Macabre, which is a rather good cyborg card against graveyard strategies that can fit into basically any sort of deck. Painter's Servant, a powerful card in Legacy that can set up a nearly auto win when paired with a Tempest card Grindstone. Reflecting Pool, an already powerful card from Tempest that, roughly 11 years after its debut, finally got a reprint. By the way, for some reason, the foil version of this card was printed with a white mana symbol as a watermark behind the rules text. Weird. Ruined Halo, the first magic card to ever grant protection to a player rather than a permanent. Savor the moment, the lowest costed free turn spell since Time Walk was printed in the game's original set. 
though at the detriment of skipping your next untap step. Swans of Bryn Argal, which is used in some combo decks to draw a large amount of cards which can then be turned into damage by way of combo pieces such as Seismic Assault or Chain of Plasma. Wheel of Sun and Moon, which is good at disrupting mill and graveyard strategies. And Vexing Shusher, a strong legacy sideboard card that can really frustrate control decks. And finally, the set's pre-release card is an alternate art, foil version of Demigod of Revenge. And its promotional release card is a special foil edition of that rather good legacy sideboard staple, Vexing Shusher. I am vexed. Shh. Vexed. So what are your thoughts on Shadamar? Are you a fan? Either way, let us know your thoughts in the comments section below. And please support Magic Untapped by subscribing to the channel here on YouTube and pop a buck in our tip jar on Patreon. Thank you for watching.